So I says, imagine screaming towards the ground at night. Hundreds of miles behind enemy lines, observing these MSRs. Trooper Bob Consiglio, the first casualty of the Gulf War. And my patrol, Bravo 30. So it came about that these were suicide missions. Des, how are you, brother? Hey, uh, Chris. Hello, mate. And uh, thanks very much for having me on the show. Oh, no, no, no. That's uh, The pleasure is all mine, Des, and, and certainly my uh, wonderful subscribers. Um, absolute classic SAS mission you were on, weren't they? Which really harps back to the early days of David Sterling, the formation of the SAS in, in the North African desert the jeeps or the land rovers you know the all kind of like loaded up with as much ammo and fuel as you can carry and and lo and behold you get to recreate that on your mission uh, during the iraq war obviously not not north africa but um it was that like an honor to sort of be able to do that long range patrolling uh, yes, it was. I mean, uh, in the book, uh, Bravo 3.0, is, it's pointed out, uh, by the way, it's all about the first Gulf War, obviously, back in 91. And it talked that only 50 years earlier that the regiment was fighting in North Africa against Rommel. And, of course, they made it very, very clear that this was um, tailor-made for them. And uh, um, we were going to be fighting out uh, desert warfare again. And they made it very, very clear that this was going to be our war. Uh, the SES was going to be involved in a big way. It was their bread and butter, hundreds of miles behind enemy lines, in vehicles, shoot and scoot, uh, disruption, just like it was in North Africa, you know, back in 1941. In fact, when the regiment was formed, uh, July the 1st, 1941. And um, yes, the regiment made it very, very clear. Um, so much so that um, we prepared by sending three squadrons out to the Middle East, preparing uh, for what was imminent. Um, Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait and he had made it very clear that he wasn't going to leave. Um, so it showed that uh, a conflict was coming about. And because of that, we saw the largest formation in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, in fact, since the Second World War. Hundreds and thousands of troops were forming up in Saudi Arabia, ready to uh, cross the border from Saudi Arabia into Iraq and Kuwait. Um, and the objective was simple, to um, oust Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. And it was as simple as that. I'll tell you in a bit my story of how I was supposed to be joining you actually set sail for iraq but the, the and i think we got one meter from the dock side and then we we went home again <laughs> but uh, uh, bravo three zero it's doing magnificently your best-selling book um written in in was it in partnership with with uh damian lewis who we've had on the podcast twice a very prolific author writes some incredible material on the on the second world war and and special forces um it's it's got so many five star reviews already you must be really happy we are incredibly happy both me and damien uh yes um i was approached by damien asked if i wanted uh, to write the story and uh, uh we've done it uh, together and yes we can't be uh, any more happier um, when he asked me if I wanted to write uh, Bravo 3.0, I'm, I'm thinking, who would want to know about this? But uh, um, what is the story, as I've just said, is about uh, the, uh, the first Gulf War back in 91. And it's about the um, Bravo 3.0. I think most people can remember, Chris, um, about Andy McNabb. And he brought out a book called Bravo 2.0. 
and that was after the Gulf War. What I think most that, people don't. Um, that, that sold a couple of coffees, mate, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think he did very, very well for uh, Andy. And, uh, and, and good for him as well. Good for him. And he, um, but what mo- most people don't realize, Chris, is that they were three patrols, three Bravo patrols uh, Bravo One, Bravo Two, and my patrol, Bravo Three Zero. And uh, when me and Damien got together and decided to write this story, um, I had to ask permission first. And we had, had been given permission, obviously. And we have gone forward to write what I think is a is a fantastic book. Not only does it talk about the Gulf War, but it talks about the tasks and missions that I've been on. It talks about uh, my life in the SES. And, um, and I think there's something in there for everyone. I've done a few talks around the country now, and I found that people... Are, um, are really, really interested about the book itself. So, yes, answering your question, we can't be any more happier, Chris, of uh, SES Bravo 3.0. Good. And you said to me earlier, um, you obviously had to wait until you, you had an extensive career in the SAS, 17 years. Um, you had to obviously wait to write your book until after you left. It probably would have, I can just imagine the... Um, I know how it works. You're always going to set upset someone in the military, no matter what you do. And writing a book tends to be quite polarizing, doesn't it? I think it's just probably a lot of petty jealousy if we were if we were um, if we were honest and schoolboy sort of stuff. But um, what what rank did you leave as? Des? Uh, yeah, it's, I was um, d- d- my old military career spanned uh, almost uh, twenty eight years. I did uh, almost uh, nine years in the parachute regiment and uh, nigh on 19 and a bit years within the SDS. So totally it's just over 28 years. Um, and I left with a rank of uh, WO2. Uh, and yes, a lot of people always ask me, how come you've waited this long to write a book? And as you can appreciate, um, out in the Gulf at that time in 91, I'd been with the regiment approximately five years. And I, I then went on to do another 70 years or so, you know. So, no, I wasn't going to get out just to write a book. I was thoroughly enjoying myself within the SES. And it was only that um, I've been out these last few years that I, I, I've been approached um, a few times to write a book. And I, I wasn't too keen. But when Damien and myself come together, I could see it was a good partnership. And I think if you want to write a book with anyone, if you're going to get all your ducks lined up, Damien is the guy to write it with. Damien has written extensively about the regiment. He's got a fantastic Second World War series that he's write all about the SES. Just nothing short of magnificent, you know. So um, once I looked into what he'd done in his background, I thought, yes, if anyone's going to write it, or help me write it, or tell my story, this is the guy. So, um, yes, so... Uh, uh, the book has come out and we are just over the moon about it, Chris, really are. I bet, mate, I'm over the moon that there's a power that can that can spell. <laughs> I can I can see there's going to be a bit of slag in here. And, uh, but let's call that uh, military banter. And I've got to take it on the chin. And uh, do you know something, Chris, because I come from Pararage, I've had a lot of... Uh, uh, feedback from uh, colleagues in Pararage, guys that I used to work with and uh, uh, and obviously guys that I don't. And, uh, yes, the banter has just been great, you know. Um, and as you know, uh, you know, for the people that are listening, the banter is, uh, is actually um, taking the mickey out of each other. Into It's actually slagging each other. It's uh, And it, it's just great humour within the military. And in fact... As you know, Chris, when you're on the ground and things get a little bit tense, guys tend to just talk a little bit more, don't they? They tend to joke a bit more. They tend to do a little bit more mickey-taking. And that's the way of releasing tension, isn't it? That's the way of just saying, look, I'm a little bit scared here. And um, uh, so you tend to joke a bit more. It's it's always recognised and it's always received very, very well. And in the book, a lot of guys have said to me, my goodness, there's a lot of humour in there, a lot of mickey-taking. And it is, it's just downright pure banter that everybody has. And uh, uh, within the military, it's just fantastic humour, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, it is. 
yeah, I was. I thought you were going to come back with a comment then about <laughs> about. I wouldn't dare. I could see we get yeah. into uh, we get into some physicals, so I thought no, we better not. We better not do that. I thought you were going to say Marines are like Paris, just only not so handsome or something. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things I could have said, but no. Des, what, what para were you in? Yeah, I used to be in the 1st Battalion, one para. And, uh, and I really enjoyed myself there. I did, as I said, eight and a half going on nine years. And um, I just decided that I thought, right, I want to go further. I want to join the SAS. And as you know, Chris, on that is that once you kind of tell everyone that you're going to the SAS, you are sending out a statement to everyone. You are telling everyone that not only are you leaving your regiment, as in this case, I was leaving Parachute Regiment, the 1st Battalion, but now I wanted a career within the SAS. And everyone knows that that's a serious move. It's a career move. And what a lot of people don't realize, Chris, is that it's actually life-changing. And it was for me. And I mentioned this in the book, Al, um, I really enjoyed myself in Pararegg. And, and, and in a way, Pararegg prepared me for the SES. And in fact, the SES, it said arguably that there's 50% of the SES regiment come from the parachute regiment. And um, so for me, the preparation in parachute regiment before I went to the SES really, really helped me. And then it became life-changing. And I'll go into detail on that about the book. Yes. I, I mean, um, you wouldn't expect anything less, would you, from one of the, the well, the toughest selection in, in the world. I'm wondering now if now they've um, now that they do this joint selection, I'm, I'm guessing there's probably far, far more Marines will join the SAS because not not everyone wants to do the, the diving bit, you know. Yes, on that one, uh, d d d when I first joined up there, it was really difficult for the Marines. You know, I really felt for them. You know, I've, I've got a few friends, uh, you know, that I keep in touch with now, Marines. They had to go, they had to jump through quite a few hoops. They actually had to get out of the Marines, come under the system of the army, and then do selection. And and obviously, if they if they didn't make it, they, they couldn't go back to the Marines. They were under the system of the army. Now it's all changed. Uh, now, you know, uh, SES, SBS, we do exactly the same selection. And all you do at the beginning, you just say, this is what I want to do. I want to go SBS or SES. But it's exactly the same. And I'm, I'm glad that has changed over the years. It's a lot, lot better. And answering your question, yes, there's a lot more Marines uh, because of that. And, and I think the two regiments, you know, uh, sister regiments of SP and SES, you know, it works together really, really well. But um, you touched on some of that about selection. Um, I've been doing some talks around the country and I'm always asked about how hard selection is and, and, and what it's about. And, and I'm not scared to say that it's the hardest thing that I've ever done. And, and even now I can feel aches and pains that I got through coming through selection. Selection itself is what it says. They don't call it a, an SES test. They call it SES selection. And what it says, that selection process, Chris, has been there since the 1950s. And what they found, Chris, is that to put a certain individual under physical stress, put them under mental stress, and then stress of sleep deprivation, what it does, it brings out the real individual. As you can appreciate, you know, going to the SAS, it's, it's, very, it's a very tough job. It's, it's very arduous. The lifestyle is not for everyone. And a lot of people coming up on, uh, to selection uh, are not fully sure what they're letting themselves in for. So what is good about the selection process is that the selection process is there to pick the right individual. And the instructors, the guys on Training Wing uh, who run the actual selection process, is that they just keep the process in that, that it's going in the right direction. And the uh, selection process picks the individual, if you like, as opposed to the instructors do. Um, just to give you some idea of what it's like, you, you do two selections a year. Uh, it lasts six months. Um, you have to prepare. You know, I prepared for many years before I went up there. And on, on my selection, I did the winter selection. So you have a winter and a summer selection. 
And on winter, I remember the first day, there were about 250, 270 guys there. And they actually say, the instructor said, right, everyone look around at each other. So we all have a look at each other. And they say, they say within um, four to six weeks, there'll only be about 40 to 50 men. And already, you know, you could see guys looking at each other, going, what, 250, 70 guys, you know, whatever. And then they say, um, going then into a month or six weeks after that, that may half again. And what you realize is that um, that in itself puts a lot of people off. Um, you realize that this is not going to be easy at all. And you're right, each day just gets harder and harder. The weeks go on, the months go on. It's broken into three phases. The first phase over the first four to six weeks is the hill fitness and navigation phase. It's exactly what it says. Uh, the next six or so weeks is out in the jungle. So you go out, you can go out to Brunei or you can go out to Belize and you do then, the, 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 you're being selected out of there. And then when you come back, the selection process carries on uh, to the remaining um, six months um, is that you have the escape and evasion phase. And you also um, learn about how to um, uh, evade being interrogated and, and what to do and how to go about it. So the three phases are very, very hard, and very, very different. And by the end of it, you're left with uh, the guys left out of selection. And then um, you go off to the regiment, you go to one of the squadrons and you begin your life in the SES. Mm. Which, which troop were you placed in? Well, yeah. well, first, uh, what it is, you go into a squadron. <clears throat> and just for the listeners, uh, you know, a squadron or a company can be something of 100, 150 men. And then, yes, it's broken down into troops. So I went to B squadron. I actually served in two squadrons over my time in the SES. I served in B and in D squadron. Um, in the Gulf, the story talks about me being in B squadron. And I was the troop that I was in, was in air troop. Um, the squadron is broken down into troops. And in each squadron, you have mobility, you have boat troop, you have mountain troop, and you have air troop. And it's really what it says. Mobility is about learning about vehicles, Land Rovers, bikes, and being able how to drive across the desert and deal with everything, even cars and, and, and machinery. So those guys in mobility are very, very good regarding that. And by the way, the Gulf War was ideal for mobility guys being out in the desert. And they learn how to navigate from the stars as well. Um, boat troop is then dealing with boats and uh, the sea, lakes, rivers, um, dealing uh, out to parachute into the sea, uh, being picked up by a submarine, uh, dealing with ships and canoes and the likes. So that is a very, very testing uh, entry, call, uh, entry skills. By the way, we call them entry skills because you tend to use these skills to enter into a conflict zone without being seen uh, uh, that you're there being picked up. Uh, the other two um, troops then is that you've got mountain troop and that's how to uh, climb mountains, ice climb, mountaineering. Um, and again, borders, a lot of borders to countries um, normally have mountains. Uh, so to gain uh, entry into a, uh, another country, you would use mountain troop to climb over and uh, the mountain and, and gain entry. And then the truck that I was in was air troop and we deal in um, high altitude free fall parachute. And well, it can be um, high altitude, which is uh, uh, halo, high altitude, low opening and hey ho, high altitude, high opening. But it's to deal with oxygen and you normally jump in at night, 25,000 feet, which is approximately five miles up, dealing with oxygen and um, how to jump with equipment. And again, your entry skill is, is jumping into that country, um, being uh, not seen or not heard. So we're, um, and uh, yes, so I, uh, I was in Air Troop B Squadron and uh, really enjoyed my time there. Did you ever jump into any form of conflict, Des? Um, uh, yes, and uh, um, 
Um, we won't be talking about it today, yeah. but uh, in the um, in the Gulf War, no, we, we didn't. Um, the and even though I talked about uh, air troop and mounted troop, boat troop, and, and mobility, is that we are all soldiers and all on the the same skills. It's just there are entry skills is is what we emphasise is how we gain entry to a particular conflict zone, but. If it means that it's just simply that you drive in, or you parachute in, or you arrive by ship, and well, then obviously just simple means like that. Well, then that's fine. But when the tasking says that yes, you must use this particular skill, entry skill, um, for certain tasking and missions, uh, well, then that is when a particular troop that is skilled. In that form of entry, as in free fall, mountaineering, boat and mobility, that is when that particular troop will be used. In this case, out in the Gulf, the whole squadron, in fact, three squadrons were out there at the time. And it was a mobility based type operation. In other words, um, in vehicles, uh, fighting in the desert. Yeah, the, the only reason I'm asking is um, obviously for a para to jump into combat is a is a it hasn't happened for what since the second world war and that's um i guess it's kind of a feather in your cap but through the back door <laughs> whatever however however we call it um, yeah yeah and I, yeah. I i can only imagine i mean the amount of quick, I mean, I've obviously I've done the basic para course and even to carry that jet jerry can, which is just one little quite safe and secure unit, isn't it? Parachuting with that is, is a thing to do it with all the equipment that, that, that a para must jump into battle with. And then to do it with all the equipment that, that a trooper must jump into conflict. It, it, I, all the, oxygen and every all the supplemental air um i i think it would be terrifying <laughs> yeah i mean just to elaborate on that just so uh you know the the the, the listeners the, you know can get some idea if you like is that um um you are normally in a a c-130 um at twenty five thousand feet uh it could be four six it could be eight guys and you are on oxygen. Uh, you are carrying all of your equipment and weapons. Um, and also you have, you can take extra equipment that you can't carry, which is like on a pallet, which when you exit the aircraft at 25,000 feet, um, breathing oxygen, this pallet on a drill shoot comes out with you as well. And it has a nasty habit in the sky of coming around and bumping into you in the sky. Um, so, uh, so just to set the scene, um, if you are going into a conflict zone, uh, you would be at 25,000 feet. So that's about five miles up. It's normally at night. You're breathing oxygen. And uh, by the way, free fall from that height is approximately two minutes. Um, so just to give some idea, people say, well, so what's that like? And I say, well, Probably the longest anyone's free fall is go to the swimming baths and jump off the top splash, and that'll be about a second or two. So I says, imagine screaming towards the ground at night, carrying excess of 150 to 200 pounds on your body, and you must um, uh, deploy your chute, uh, obviously at the right time and uh, jumping with equipment with other guys in the sky with also a pallet that is on a drove shoot as i said that has a nasty habit of coming and bumping into you um j just on a serious note it's it's not for everyone it's it's very very dangerous a lot of things happen and um and it's it's um it, it takes a, a lot of training um just getting the problems with hypoxia at that height is concerned you um you know that you you can't think properly um and and this happens sometimes that your equipment freezes up so you come to the tailgate of the c-130 ready to jump off and your altimeters are freezing up 
your goggles have frozen up, the equipment that you're breathing has frozen up. And I'm mentioning this about freezing because there's a story in the book that talks about me jumping and uh, uh, we were jumping at night in a cold country, which was about 30 degrees below. And that was yeah, obviously very, very difficult and very testing. I won't give too much detail, but it talks about how when we exited uh, the aircraft and when our chutes deployed, how we had strong winds and nearly got blown into another country. So um, I'll let people read the story. And uh, it's, um, it's even though we can laugh about it now, it was very testing and difficult at the time. But uh, and to, to, just to emphasize all the troops, I mean, boat troop, I mean, to, to dive and to come out submarines, very testing. I mean, mobility going across the desert. I mean, the mountain boys climbing mountains and ice climbing. All those uh, environments, you know, working against the elements, Chris, as you know, is, is the most testing. People always say to me, you know, what's, what's the hardest things you do? And I say, you know, fighting against the wind, the, wind, the rain, the cold. And when you're out in the environment, you know, like parachuting and, and in the sea, you know, and scuba diving and mountaineering, and it's very, very testing. It's very, very dangerous. And it takes, it takes a lot of training. It's not for everyone. And hence, what I said earlier, this is the idea of the selection process itself. It selects a certain type of individual, which is up for this type of lifestyle. Yes. Des, when you said the pallets are dangerous, they, they also da- didn't they dangerously drop to the bottom of the South Atlantic in the in the insertion into the Falklands? I think Rob Robin has told us, Robin or Bob Shepherd told us uh, this yeah. this story. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the full details, but uh, I know there was a, a book that came out uh, last year, a very good book um, by a guy in the regiment that uh, spoke about. That what happened down in the in the Falklands and uh, and yes, um, I've I've heard that story and uh, yes, you you can go in with all your equipment and jump into the sea, for example, and it does uh, a silly thing like sink to the bottom. So mm. and you have nothing left then. And, and bear in mind these entry skills of climbing in, driving in, um, you know, going in by boat and free falling. These are just your entry skills. Once you get into that country, you've then got the task and the mission to carry out. So um, it may sound all uh, uh, really good to do this sort of thing. Not only is it dangerous, but it's just the form of getting you there. Once you're there, you've then got to do the job. Mm. Des, did you, were you in the Falklands? Uh, no, no, I wasn't. I was uh, uh, I was in one para at that time, and as you can appreciate, two para and three para went out there, and we got we got a little bit of Mickey take he took out of us. So uh, no, I, I weren't in that one. Yes, yes, one para, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's go back to selection. So when you're on one of these um, tabs, uh, Sorry, the name slip. What, what they call it on slip? Not a force march, but you know what I mean. A low- yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you can call it a um, a force march, tabbing, yeah. uh, marching. I know the Marines call it yomping, don't you? Yeah. Well, yeah. we uh, that's our slang, but we actually call it load carrying. So okay, yeah, um, yeah. Can, can you like talk us through that? Because I'm fascinated. Because I I didn't get good at stuff like that until I was a. I think 48 years old and I, I ran the length of the country and my backpack was 15 kilos. So yes, probably a similar. Yeah. Not quite the 40 pounds, but, but not far off it. And I, I found that I got really good at it. I mean, my heart rate for a start dropped so low that when I went to hospital and they checked my pulse one time, they put me in the, um, like that emergency unit because yeah. I thought they, they couldn't believe my heart rate was so, and the, after I went, I waited there about two hours and finally a doctor came and said, do you do ex- extreme sport? And I said, well, I've just run the length of the UK. They went, Oh, that'll be it. <laughs> but yeah, um, it's, yeah. But as an ad, I was saying adult, you know, but as, as an older person, I found my I mentally I got my head around it a lot more and hills like that 
with this back, I, I just, I, I ran up all of them because it was easier to run than it was to walk. But I do remember when I was, you know, back when I was in the mob, uh, I mean, I left when I was 25, so I was, I was quite young then. But I found it really, trying to keep up with the troop was just obviously not impossible because I've got my green lid, but it was, um, it was really hard work for so someone with short legs. And I weighed, when I joined up, I think I weighed about nine and a half stone. Um, so, so when I, I will get to the point, the point I'm getting to is when I ran the, the length of the country, I was listening to Aunt Middleton's audio book and he was talking about his tabbing in the paras. Then he was talking about his selection. And I thought I, all I could think was, God, I, I could probably handle it at this age. <laughs> but back when I was a you know teenager or whatever, I'd, I, I think I'd have had no, no chance. So what it's a brave thing to go on selection. I mean, it, it's these things, not easy. Do you have to know how good you are at the at the weight at the load carrying? Do you just go? Oh, I'm just going to give it a go. Do, do you do a lot of training? How how is it? Uh, at that time, um, the it's not like today where people tend to know more about what goes off in the regiment. But what is good about the regiment? Ninety percent of what they do, people don't know, and and that's the way it should be. Back then, when I uh, I volunteered, it's a volunteer process, and I put pen to paper, is that you still don't know anything. And, and what you had to do, you had to wait for guys to come back off selection. In other words, fail, come back, have a chat with them and go, right, how did you get on? And what did you have to do? And, um, you know, all the normal questions that you would ask. And then, you know, they would say, well, I tell you what, I'm going to go up for my second go because you can only have two goes. So they would say, why don't you come with me up on the hills? I'll show you what we did and, and I'll be able to tell you all about it. So you, that's the only way that you tend to find out what actually happens on selection. There's nothing laid down. They don't send you any pamphlets. At that time, there was no way that you could go up and find information. I believe it's different nowadays. So what you have to do is get information from other guys. And when you are up there on selection, as I said about, it's broken into three uh, phases. And the first phase is, is fitness, hill work, and navigation. So as you know, as a soldier, you carry everything on your back, on your backpack, and you've got to navigate from A to B. So this itself is that selection process of testing the individual physically, putting them under physical stress, the mental stress of being able to navigate and, and everything that comes with it, and, and obviously uh, going uh, over hills. And you have to do it in a certain time. And the other stress that comes in is that they don't tell you. They don't tell you what the time is. Um, you, They just say, uh, we want you to go from this grid to that grid. And, you, you know, it'll either be from one mountain top down into a valley up to another mountain top down to another valley and so on. And you'll have an instructor there once you get there and he'll point out and he'll say, tell me where you are. You'll show him and he'll go, right, go to grid one, two, three, four, five, six. And off you go again. So um, what you find you do beforehand is get as much information as you can. Get yourself as fit as you can. Get your map reading up to par. Okay. And, and I did further things like I prepared myself with more weapon training. And, um, and, and in the paras, what is good is that you're generally fit all the time. You know, we... You know, the soldiering, you're, you're expected after eight, nine years of being in the paras that your soldiering skills are up to par. And, and you are quite a, a knowledgeable guy by that time. So for me, yes, I'd already become an accomplished soldier by that time. And I knew quite a bit and, and, and I brushed up on skills, which, may, which is common sense, really, before I went up there. But in a way, these, that's the only thing you can do is prepare the best you can. Fitness, navigation, and just do as much as I can, soldier-wise. Once you get up there, then you've just got to go for it because obviously you come across stuff that you didn't know. And it's it, the only – I go into detail in the book, 
but it is just very, very hard, very, very testing. Um, there's no shouting. Uh, there's no encouragement. They just ask you politely to do something. You do it. And, uh, um, and you <clears throat> are hopefully there by the end of the process. Someone said to me, you know, how did you get on just thinking all the whole of the six months? If you think, my goodness, this is what I've got to do for six months, you won't make it. You've just got to go from day to day. And by the way, when you go up there, when I put pen to paper, when I told everybody that I was leaving Parachute Regiment, you've got to go up with the attitude that you're going to get in, not go up and use terminology and saying, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to see how I get on. I didn't. I just said, I'm going to get in. So <laughs> the pressure was on already. And um, it took me two attempts. Uh, I didn't make it on the first attempt. I got injured and I come back. And uh, luckily, I did it on my second attempt. Uh, people said to me, what was harder, the first or the second one? Definitely the second one, because you know what's coming. <laughs> and they're uh, very, very painful, very, very difficult. But uh, I was lucky uh, to pass, did my six months uh, selection process, uh, then went on to probation. Probation is about three years. And then I had uh, a life, a full life and career within the regiment itself. And I talk about that in the book. And I had just a fantastic uh, time and I had a fantastic life within both Parridge and within the SES. Yes. And your, um, did I gather your growing up, Des, was uh, there was a few challenges? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I could turn around and I could say this was difficult, that was difficult. Have you heard of the rap stars? All the rap stars said, well, yeah, I've been shot four or five times and I come from the wrong side of town and I come from the hood and this, that and do that. Actually, yes, I come from Sheffield, which is a uh, you know, big city. And, and I think like all these big cities, you have the, the rough side and, and the good side. And it's, it's really down to your mum and dad to keep her on the straight and narrow. I can honestly say that uh, I had a good start. You know, it's so easy for me to turn around and say, yeah, Chris, I come from the bad side of town and everything was against me. I had a great family, great mum and dad. They loved me to bits, kept me on the straight and narrow. Yes, these, you know, these, it's so easy, you know, to get involved in all the bad stuff. And, you know, so Chris, I think in the book, I, I talk about, I got in trouble with the police once as a teenager. I think I, I smashed a lamp throwing some stones my mother was so disgusted that I'd let her down. You know, she said, this isn't how we brought you up, and et cetera, et cetera. And I felt so bad that I'd let my family down that I never got in trouble with the police again. And, um, and I think uh, I mentioned in the book about my mother, my father, my grandfather, um, were obviously great. So uh, it just kept me on the straight and narrow. My granddad had been in the Second World War. And my dad had been in national service. So I think the influence was already there then, Chris, of, uh, you know, all the morals and virtues that you would find coming from the military service. Um, my granddad was well respected. Um, you know, my dad was because he'd been in national service. And, and, and I had a, a great family. The, yes, it was a rough city. And I talk about that in, in the book itself. And I go into detail how it was easy to go to the wrong side but i had these people not just me my mother um my granddad and my dad but there was other people in my life as well and um, I, I think it's that thing chris i think that if you really want something in life and at that time i had no idea i was going to join the military but i think once you see that people are making the effort to try and keep you on the straight and narrow and do good things for you, well, then it makes sense for you to respond accordingly. And I think I've seen that all along through my life. Um, I had good people in the Paris that, uh, that mentored me and kept me on the straight and narrow. They were in the Paris and same within the regiment as well. And I talk about this in the book, but uh, I think all way across my journey within the military, it was 28 years, um, there's been people all the way along that uh, has, has helped me uh, to achieve my goals and, and especially in the military helped me to have a great career uh, both in the Paris and the SAS. Mm. So Des, let's get to the desert. You're, you're out there. You actually made it to Iraq. I, um, I didn't get that far. I, I was on ship. I think I told you this. I was on ship at the time and we we're on a para course, right? 
And there used to be this thing in the Marines that it was really hard to get on a paracourse. And we just rang up like Bryce Norton and they went, yeah, just come. So our ship's detachment, we just rocked up at Bryce Norton. That I think I mentioned this. I shared, I shared a room with two SAS guys. Um, won't say their names because I don't know if they want to be mentioned, but really solid lads. One was from the same city as me. And they said, um, do you know Bob Consiglio? He's a, he's a Marine that's just joined our lot. And that course was cancelled because the Hercules had to fly, fly out to the Middle East. So we can, we could, we only did the balloon jump on that course. And um, when I got home, and I said to these guys, I said, yeah, I, I don't know Bob Percy, but in the Marines, it's a name everybody knows because he was, he was in 40 commando and he was the first, we, we thought then he was the first Marine that had ever uh, joined the SAS. And what he had to do, like you said, he had to leave the Marines, join the army or something like this, and then apply for the S like, like this, this sort of route. And, um, when I got home from that course, I was watching telly. It was the news. There was a coffin coming out of a church, draped with the Union flag. And the newsreader said, today the people of such and such a place buried the body of Trooper Bob Consiglio, the first casualty of the Gulf War. So you can imagine my, um, I was gobsmacked just just weird. There's just talking about this man the day, but day before. And, uh, actually his, his sons were at least used to watch, watch my podcast a lot. Um, I should say wow. step, step, step son, So I don't cause any confusion. <laughs> um, so we went back to ship and our ship set sail. I, I said all my goodbyes, packed all this stuff to go off to war. And um, as we left Portsmouth Harbour, or we were just literally sat in our mess deck waiting to leave the side. And the captain came over the tunnel and said, to hear it, to hear it. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that they're sending the Atlantic conveyor instead. <laughs> and and uh, I should point out that that was the new, the new Atlantic conveyor, obviously. Yeah. Um, the original being sunk in the Falklands. And mm -hmm. all around the ship, Des, you could hear, all the Matlows just cheering. They couldn't believe it. They didn't want to go to war. Right, okay. <laughs> they, they wanted oh, to yeah. stay home with their girlfriends and stuff. Yeah. And in our mess deck, there was 12 Marines just staring, yeah. staring at the floor. Teddy's out yeah. the pram. Yeah, um, gotcha. So, so to actually, so you made it that far, you made it to the, to, to, to the desert. You're there in theater. How did this particular pro, a uh, patrol comes around. Uh, I'm guessing you you have a patrol briefing. Yeah. And by the way, you mentioned Bob earlier on. Bob was just a lovely guy. Me and him used to live in the block together. And um, I mentioned him in the book. And uh, he used to like uh, a certain group called the Blow Monkeys. And he always used to be playing uh, this in the block. And uh, uh, yeah, he's he just a, a lovely guy. And it was, uh, it was very sad to um, hear about what had happened. And uh, at the end of the Gulf. I've mentioned him in the book uh, just simply because we knew each other fairly well. As I said, we, we more or less lived each next to each other in, in, the, in the block. But uh, to answer your question is that, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the patrols come about, I think, just uh, the, the, a little bit of background for everyone is that, uh, yeah, Saddam Hussein had um, invaded Kuwait. You had hundreds of thousands of troops forming up, US-led in Saudi Arabia. Um, the SES had made it clear that three squadrons were going to be fighting uh, all the way through the desert up to Baghdad, typical Second World War stuff. And um, uh, and then what, what had happened is that the um, the leader of Iraq at that time, Saddam Hussein, was very, very clever. And what he started to do, he started to fire uh, rockets, missiles, um, they call them mobile scud rockets, and he would fire them onto neighboring countries, particularly onto Israel. Um, we're trying to bring them into the war. Um, he knew that if Israel entered the war, 
is that it would change the dynamics in the Middle East. And there was a very good chance that all the neighboring countries to Iraq and the Middle East would side with Iraq and fight against Israel. And obviously, this would change the whole dynamics in the Middle East, make it completely unstable and would cause some real problems. There was another thing that was there was worried about as well is that Saddam had been fighting against Iran on the border in the 80s for about a year with a loss of about quarter million troops. And he had used chemical weapons against Iran. In fact, he'd used them against his own people, the Kurds. So we knew that it was only a matter of time that chemical, chemical weapons would be used. Um, so Israel coming into the war, chemical weapons being used, and then with the, the, the region itself, if we could add oil to the uh, mixture as well, there was a very good chance that there was going to possibly be a third world war. In fact, our commanders were saying that if Israel and chemical weapons being used, and because of that part of the world becoming unstable, there was a very good chance that Third World War would come about. Now, that sounds, Chris, very, very dramatic, me saying that here, very dramatic. When you're out there and you see hundreds of thousands of troops forming up and you see all the aircraft and you see all the mechanized units and you'll see my regiment formed up, ready to go, and you thought, this is not far off the mark. So what they decided to do was that because the SES had two squadrons which were already committed to fight independently from the Saudi border, go all the way up the desert and fight to Baghdad, is that they decided to use my squadron, B squadron at the time, and form three Bravo patrols. That's how the Bravo patrols came about. And he, our mission was pure and simple, was to go 100 miles behind enemy lines, find and locate these mobile Scud rockets, send back coordinates so they could send in airstrikes and eliminate the targets. And that is how the Bravo patrols came about. Our first uh, role of B Squadron was BCRs, Battle Casualty Replacements. And I mentioned this in the book. A Squadron and D Squadron was to fight independently. They were battle ready. They'd already been prepared out in the Middle East. My squadron, B Squadron, we were there just to replace the injured and the dead of those two squadrons. That was it, pure and simple. We was in rear echelon in Saudi Arabia. So anyone that was injured and killed in A and D squadron, we were simply to replace them. It was only when Saddam started to fire rockets onto Israel that Israel said they had a battalion of paratroopers on standby. And if it wasn't sorted out, they would parachute onto Baghdad. And then obviously, you know, it would have been the start of World War Three. Then chemical weapons would have been fired and the oil and everything, just uh, a real um, confusing uh, complexity of uh, a, a real bad cocktail, if you like. So the three Bravo patrols went to find these needles in a haystack. And in the book, it talks about the problems that all of the patrols had. Bravo uh, one zero, Bravo two zero, and my patrol, Bravo three zero. And we go into uh, depth of the, the how, how we uh, what we did in that conflict and the problems that we had uh, trying to prevent Third World War. Yes, um, b before we come on to um, Bravo Three Zero, can you just clarify? Because obviously, every most <laughs> unless people have been asleep for the last twenty years, most people know of Bravo Two Zero, but Bravo One Zero, what was there? What was their uh, rough role? Uh, yes, it was exactly the same. What, what it was is that the intelligence told us that these mobile Scud rockets, if, if, if you can appreciate it, it's, um, these rockets are like on a big uh, articulated lorry. They could drive anywhere. Uh, the, these rockets, Scud rockets, are about uh, uh, 30 feet long, and they can drive anywhere. Then they would elevate, fire these rockets off, and then um, drive away. Um, and they, the intelligence told us that they were main supply routes, MSRs, which are freeways coming out, roads coming out of Baghdad. And they were saying that they were almost sure that these mobile Scud rockets, these missiles, were traveling up and down these MSRs 
um, the three patrols, Bravo 1, 2, and 3, was to go and put OPs in observation posts, observe these mobile Scud rockets, uh, find and locate them, and send back coordinates over the radio to bring in airstrikes. Uh, so all of the patrols were to do exactly the same job. We were all to work independently because we were all in different areas um, behind enemy lines. And this was hundreds of miles behind enemy lines, observing these MSRs um, and trying to find and locate these SCUD missiles. Um, there was a tongue in cheek that was going about that when the uh, Bravo patrols came about, um, the people started to say that these were suicide missions. Um, as you can appreciate, um, we were the furthest coalition forces, just three patrols, hundreds of miles behind enemy lines, um, observing these, uh, trying to observe or find these mobile Scud rockets and send these coordinates back was quite a, a hard thing to do. So everyone was saying that there's a very good chance that if we were behind enemy lines, we'd be by ourselves. We were almost certain to get compromised and therefore get killed. So it came about that these were suicide missions. Even though we laughed about it and it was a tongue in cheek, we know along with the same phrase as Second World War stuff, sorry, Third World War, is that uh, um, suicide missions wasn't far off the mark as well. So we used to joke that there was no pressure on the Bravo patrols at all. We used to joke in Bravo 30 that we're only going hundreds of miles behind enemy lines to prevent World War Three, and also um, maybe this might be a suicide mission anyhow. Even though we laughed about it, we know that it had a serious tone as well, Chris. Yes, that's what squaddies do best, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. uh, laugh in the face of danger. I mean, you've got to. Um, how far, I mean, where, where were you based in the actual country? I'm, I'm getting, I, I've got different sort of pictures in my head here, Des, because obviously there's been a lot of films made about this, you know, was well, certainly about Bravo 2-0 over the years. And I think the one with Sean Bean, they're all sort of camped out in the desert and drinking whiskey from the bottle. And, and, and it all looked a bit, I don't know, a bit hands on. You might tell me, no, we were actually in a, a five star hotel in, in, you know, Q8 or somewhere. No, uh, I'll go into detail in the book, but just uh, for your listeners is that uh, we obviously started from UK. Uh, we flew out to Cyprus first. From Cyprus, we went over to the UAE. Uh, we um, From the UAE, then we flew out down to Al Juf in Saudi Arabia, and there was an air base there. So we were in preparation there at Al Juf, and that is where a lot of the troops and a lot of the uh, American Air Force were located. And then it was from Al Juf then that we were then flown um, and we started our mission uh, out uh, hundreds of miles behind enemy lines. But Al Juf was the main air base of where we were at in Saudi Arabia. And I give more detail in the book of how it all came about. I mean, it came about very, very quick. I mean, for example, um, the squadron that I was in at that time, we wasn't in the conflict. We had a different mission in UK. And what it was, we were getting ready to go on, on Christmas leave, if you like. Then suddenly uh, a squadron came back, took over our role. We went out. And um, so I had Christmas leave. Um, and within within a few days, I was hundreds of miles behind enemy lines. In January, um, if I've got my dates right, we flew out within, it was round about the 10th or 12th of uh, January. Uh, we was on the ground about the 15th, 16th or so. So everything happened fairly, fairly quick. I give details in the book and uh, um, everything happened very, very fast. Um, it, we also talked about some of the mistakes that happened and, uh, um, and, and some of the, uh, the things that, that, that shouldn't have happened, but, but they do. Some of these things happen because the speed of conflict and the confusion 
but there were things that happened that there was also mistakes as well, you know, weapon systems left behind, certain equipment that we didn't have. Um, we didn't have the right mapping. We didn't have the right vehicles, uh, the right equipment, clothing uh, and the likes. So I go into detail again about that in the book. And it's, it's, it's no way of a, it's like, it's more a way of, of facts, if you like. And when you read about some of the things that went wrong, uh, then you can understand the reasons why. If you don't have the right equipment and the right intelligence, well, then when you get on the ground and you realise that it's been wrong, well, then it's just the case of, tell you what, we've just got to get on with it, Chris. And it's no use whinging and whining. It's that typical soldier stuff, isn't it? Just get on with it. Yes. I heard a story when the, um, in, in the second Gulf War, that when the first uh, contingent of American, let's just call them politic, you know, sort of leaders um, went out, flew out there, their only source of um, information about the country of Iraq was a, was a Lonely Planet guidebook. <laughs> Um, I think the maps you guys were using, weren't they from the Second World War or something? Yeah, it's, uh, you've touched on it there, is that uh, our mapping, uh, if I remember right, my map, I think had 1945 on it, I think it said. The clothing that I had, I had, I had a smock which had 1942 in it. Um, we didn't have battle-ready vehicles. Uh, we didn't have cold-weather clothing. Um, we didn't get the right frequencies for the radios um, and they, we didn't have the right intelligence. Uh, for example, even though you can't predict the weather, um, we were told that it was going to be like a mild spring in UK. And it actually turned out to be the coldest winter that they had on record. And it actually snowed when we were out there, Chris. And just to underline that, Chris, it was that cold that men from my regiment actually died with hypothermia. Yes, I think that was written about in, in Andy's book, wasn't it? it yes. And, and even though, um, you know, when you talk about not having the right weapon systems or ammunition being left behind and, and not having the right equipment and clothing. Uh, there's some things that, okay, we can argue today shouldn't have happened. But uh, for example, we were told intelligence wise that yes, it was going to be a mild spring uh, like it was in UK and the ground was very soft and it was very undulating. And actually once we got on the ground, it was like concrete. It was a lunar landscape. It was freezing weather. And we didn't have cold weather equipment for out there. I mean, it was freezing, Chris. So, in fact, at one stage, I've written in the book that the RSM of our regiment at that time actually went down to the markets, the souks in Al Juf, actually bought a load of coats and got them on helicopters and sent them out to the actual two squadrons that were out on the ground, A squadron and D squadron, because they were having problems as well. I've written about them in the book. And um, obviously we didn't get any of that equipment because we were hundreds of miles behind enemy lines, you know, and, and we were the, we didn't have anything like that. Um, uh, these things happen. It's just the way it is. When you get on the ground and you realize that everything that you've been told intelligence wise is wrong. Well then Chris, as you know, as a soldier, you can't whinge and whine and bellyache. You just get on with the task. And besides Chris is that once you are ordered to do something, you are given a task a mission. you've got to carry it out the best you can. You can't just say, no, I'm not going to do this. You, this is your job. This is what you do. Um, and this is any soldier in any regiment. And in this case, you know, um, I'm telling a story about our patrol, an SES regiment, and we have a certain reputation of getting the job done. In fact, most of the situations that we are put into, Chris, and I think this is across the military, you know, broadly, is that we, most of the time, the British units, and especially the SES, we're put into negative situations. 
but we are expected to bring about a positive outcome. Hence, that goes all the way back to what I talked about earlier, Chris, about selection process itself. You've got to have a certain individual that will see the job through. And I think our British military is just fantastic for doing this. You know, I've worked with many, many units around the world, many good units. And I know the respect that the British forces have. Um, I've worked with many units that say, um, are the British forces getting involved in this conflict? And the answer is normally yes. And they do. Oh, thank goodness. You know, we know that a good job is going to be done. So we have a good reputation around the world. That's the British military on a whole, which is fantastic. And in my opinion, um, we are the best uh, armed forces in the world. Uh, but going back to what I said is that when you're on the ground and you realize the intelligence wrong, Chris, guess what? It's wrong. What are you going to do? You've just got to get on with the uh, task in hand and just do the best you possibly can. I go into much detail in the book and, um, and I'm just touching on things today. Uh, when people read the book, they'll know exactly uh, what I'm on about. And uh, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, I give facts, I give opinions. And, and actually being there on the ground and seeing what's happened, well, then obviously I can say exactly what happened and didn't happen. So we're, uh, I think people will be interested to read uh, all of what I'm about to say. So your patrol, Des, how, how were you being inserted in the, into this landscape? Uh, yes, we were inserted by helicopter, uh, by Chinooks. We, we went in by vehicles. We had two vehicles that were carried in by these helicopters, now, now, people say they go, well, how come the other two patrols, Bravo 1, 0, Bravo 2, went in by foot and you went in and used a couple of vehicles? In each patrol, you've got eight, eight guys. And, and it's what they do is that they, once you were given the mission, the task, um, the way you deploy, I talked about the entry skills earlier on and, and what we actually do as SES soldiers. The expertise is the guys on the ground, that is us. So how we carry out that task and that mission is entirely up to us. The intelligence showed that the operation of finding these mobile Scud missiles could be carried out on foot, but also could be carried out in vehicles. So two of the patrols decided to go in on foot, uh, but Bravo 30, we decided to go in by vehicle. So those two Land Rovers, um, were inserted by two Chinooks helicopters, and we were flown hundreds of miles uh, uh, onto target. Uh, and by the way, on them Chinooks was all three patrols, Bravo 1, 2, and 3, with the two Land Rovers. And we were inserted out onto the ground. And, uh, um, and that was uh, how it all started. Hmm. Did you, um, whereas Bravo 2 had comms, issues didn't they something to do with the radio frequencies did did you have good comms from the start uh, no in fact all three patrols had problems and this was uh, it caused some of the main major issues um just to make it clear to the, the people that are listening these are not comms that you can actually speak in these are uh, these are actually communications that you send um e electronically if you like and uh, they are coded messages. So there is always a delay. Now, we didn't know at the time that we'd been given, all three patrols had been given the wrong frequencies. So therefore, once we were trying to send messages, we could see that there was problems from the start. Uh, we were getting messages being sent out, but we were getting garbled messages coming back. And this was down to, again, to mistakes that had been made. Bravo 1 Zero had these problems and Bravo 2 especially. And it was only when we we're on the ground that when we got off the helicopters in our vehicles that we could see that the ground was like concrete and it was flat. It was like a billiard table. And we knew that uh, as the days went on, we were having more and more difficulties and we had two vehicles. And we were thinking, well, if we're having problems, the other two patrols has got to be having problems as well because they're on foot. Now, bear in mind, we couldn't communicate with them. We were having problems communicating back to headquarters. So we know that, that all three patrols were having problems. And then not only was did we have the shortfalls of 
the communications, but not having proper mapping and not having proper uh, weapons and, and not having the right uh, ammunition and uh, uh, the vehicles weren't uh, battle ready. Um, we And then the, it was freezing cold weather. It started to snow. And then we and we also knew then that uh, uh, there'd been fatalities on the ground. We could tell by some of the garbled messages that we were having that things wasn't right. And uh, and then in the book, I'll go into more detail of some of the problems that we had. And, and I was asked the question why we didn't abort, why didn't we come back? And and, and one night we could see in the distance, we could see um, my dad being bombed. We could see how it was being lit up and we could see aircraft, or at least we could see the traces and the lights of explosions. And we sat in our vehicles watching this. And it was only afterwards that we put our heads together and said, you know, we, we knew that evening that people were being killed, possibly innocent people, not intentionally, but as you know, in conflict, you get fallout. We knew that things were going bad for us then, and we had vehicles. So we knew the other patrols were having problems as well. And we just said to ourselves that, what we'd seen of Baghdad getting bombed and, and we knew that was going to go on and go on. We just said to ourselves that we would try everything we possibly could within, uh, you know, within our mission to try and achieve it, if you like, uh, before we return to base. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we all agreed with that because uh, yes, you could say, look, we didn't have the right frequencies. We didn't have this, that, and the other, but uh, we still had a job to do. We still had a task. We still had a mission. And we've been ordered to do this. We're soldiers. We've got to carry out the best we can. We can't just give up. So that's what we did. So um, eventually we had problems along the way as well. Uh, I know I keep saying details in the book, but um, yes, eventually we got into trouble and um, the problems, um, our hand was forced to do certain things. Um, so yes, that's how it come about there. There was lots of things gone wrong, Chris, and uh, um, and in the book, I'll go into great detail. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know um, how, when you're on the ground, how you know whether you're going to be able to be extracted or not, you know, did you... I mean, were they getting your messages and you're just like fingers crossed or or how, how was that? Yes. We, in our mission, we had that we were obviously going to be dropped off at a certain place and we were going to be picked up at a certain place. But once we realized that communications were, 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 were difficult, um, we started to think about, well, because we've got vehicles, you know, we, there's a we may have to drive back to Saudi. There was also other things in the mission as well, is that behind us, coming up behind us, we had two Sabre squadrons. We had A squadron and D squadron that had already set off from um, the Saudi border and was coming up through the desert behind us. There was also part of our mission that we was hopefully going to meet up with one of either squadron. So we had that in mind as well. There was many things within the mission. I mean, the main mission was to find the mobile Scud rockets. But within the mission itself, there were other things that, yes, we could have drove back to Saudi if we had to extract ourselves. We could meet up uh, with a RD squadron. So there was other things in our minds that we we're going to do, even though we were having problems with our radio. What we were hoping is that along the way is that the radio communications, we would be able to sort them out eventually and be able to get clear comms. Meanwhile, as I said earlier, Chris, we had a job to do. We had a task to do. Just because we didn't have comms, is it a good enough excuse to say, well, you know, we've got to turn around and come back. We got on with a task in hand and, uh, and did what we had to do, Chris. Yeah. and. Um obviously don't take anything away from the book, which I'll, I'll, I'll put a link friends at home. I'll put a link below the podcast so you can grab yourselves a copy. Um, I was reading a bit of it earlier on the, 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 they let you read a bit on, on Amazon. So um, yes, uh, extremely engaging from, from the start. Des, um, can you just give our, our, 
friends at home an idea i mean you, was there any excitements um was there any funny moments or or, or what you know what was it like being out there uh, yes i mean um yes there's there's a lot of incidents within in the book and i'll just point out uh, just a few of them uh uh on the infiltration when we're on the helicopters we got engaged by a top gun fighter pilot that had a lock on and was ready for shooting us out the sky so i talk in depth about what happened there uh we had some real problems um we thought we were going to get shot out the sky even um, before we'd start our mission um we were bumping into people all the time on the ground as you can appreciate we were pretending uh to be iraqi troops and we were bumping into them all the time our um, our signature was is that we had two uh, uh crappy uh, vehicles um we had uh, all different types of uniform on we had shemags on and look like uh, the iraqi armed forces had a mixture of uniforms and troops so we were trying to pass ourselves off as them and we were bumping into them all the time um we nearly got uh, shot and blown up by a uh, a fighter again that uh, was firing at us on the ground and we uh, that nearly finished us as well and then we had real problems chris with uh, we knew we were going down with hypothermia all of us so we were getting in a really really bad situation um our vehicle started to let us down uh one of the vehicles broke down itself and we had lots and lots of problems <laughs> while we was out there chris um I, as i says in the book um i think people will be very interested to hear about this story itself and it shines light on to the other stories of bravo 20 and and uh, and, and bravo 10 uh, but it also talks about other missions that have been on other things that i've done within the ses um it talks about my opinion all about the gulf and what happened at that time and he talks about my life growing up and and how i joined the armed forces itself but uh, it uh, it's not just about the gulf itself it's uh, there's something there for everyone and uh, i i had a talk with um, some ladies um, not so long ago of about 200 ladies and i was very surprised how much they liked the book uh, as we can appreciate chris i mean this respectfully this sort of genre tends to be for the guys don't it what in this case the ladies you know really enjoyed the book so um i for the ladies out there i think they'll enjoy it as well so um i think it's a great book and i think there's something there for everybody chris yes good um and i'm sure there is des what uh, otherwise you wouldn't have had coming up for 500 uh reviews on amazon well um and so congratulations but uh, to to finish off then mate um can you tell us a bit about the your close protection work uh yes uh, in the book i've mentioned about um when i got out of the regiment the question that's always asked is uh, what sort of work do you do when you get out in the ses and when i was in there i used to be on the close protection wing most people know it as as bodyguard and um and what i what i did i went into an area in in as we call it civvy street when i was out after the regiment and uh, uh looking after celebrities and uh, people always ask me to do some name dropping and um i've looked after security wise for footballers that would be uh, Jamie Redknapp uh, Rob Keane uh, Les Ferdinand and i've done security uh, on the pop world that would be Christine Aguilera uh, Sia uh, Rod Stewart um i've done security for TV um Jeremy Kyle uh, and uh, Jim Davison and i've also done quite a bit of security on the bond films so looking after Piers Brosnan and Halle Berry and some of the other films as well that's just the name job some of uh, just a few people always ask me you know what's it like looking after some of these celebrities and the vast majority on them are, are, are good it's it's a difficult sort of of work because celebrities want to be seen they they, they want to be on the red carpet 
um, they want to uh, uh, be interviewed and uh, talk. So it's not like what I've been used to doing covert operations where you tend to do security and protection where they are not seeing anyone. So, um, but yes, I enjoyed it. Um, it is very good. So um, people uh, always like to hear about that. Before that, I was doing uh, security for top media organizations, mainly uh, American ones, ABC, NBC, CBS, and that would be war correspondents going out to conflict zones like Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya. And th th that's only because we've worked out in that part of the world. So therefore, you tend to be more climatized to it and more uh, in the know of what needs to be done regarding security wise. So you are asked many times to come and work for these organizations. So I did that for a few years. I quite enjoyed that, but I particularly enjoyed the um, the celebrity, uh, the VIPs ones as well. And I tend to keep in contact with some of them today, so which is uh, quite nice. Uh, I, oh, just on, I know we're doing a podcast today. I did a podcast just recently with Jeremy Kyle, and I pointed out to him that I did security for him uh, uh, and he going, ah, yes, I remember like, so we had a bit of uh, uh, laughter and banter sort of thing. And uh, he was a um, particularly nice guy to look after. He's he's very much up on the military and, and does a lot for the military organizations, which is great to see. But uh, so that was my life after the regiment. And, and now I went and people call me an author. What about that, Chris? You yes. know, so... Um, now I um, have, um, uh, you know, I'm a, an author or co-author, and I tend to live my life between two parts of the world. I've lived out in the Middle East for many years, out in the UAE, and here in the UK. And I like both places very, very much. And um, I've been very, very pleased the response and reaction that we've had regarding the book. I mean, and at first, you're always wary about bringing out a book. I know we touched on it at first, Chris, you know, in being in the military and what have you. But it's been a very, very pleasurable experience. And I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed working with the people. I like their mindset, their ethos, hard work. Uh, let's get on. Let's bring out a good product. And of course, Chris, we've been used to that over the years, haven't we, working in the military? So it's nice working with like-minded people. And um, it's been great uh, experience bringing out this book and I'm, I'm doing talks now and meeting people. And, and um, as you can see, I have no problems talking, Chris. And uh, yeah. by the way, I've really enjoyed it today. It's been fantastic, Chris. Oh, it's been a pleasure having you, Des. I'm still trying to get my head around the fact James Bond as a bodyguard. <laughs> I was a big James Bond fan and that has just ended. What a bloody wimp. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's I wouldn't say so much as a bodyguard, more as security and uh, um, pointing the way to go of what to do and what not to do. And uh, I suppose it's, um, no, it's not bodyguard as such. It, there, there's a difference, Chris, as we know, isn't there? You know, security, security, bodyguard is different. But uh, yes, um, no, um, keep that image, Chris, you know, as far as James Bond, I don't want it to be spoiled because I, I like the James Bond films as well. And uh, um, working on those films was a pleasure, by the way. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. James Bond's going to be a woman very shortly. So um, uh, um, no, so disres heard. no disrespect yeah. to wonderful women, but I, I think like probably most rational people, I quite like my Bond to be a bloke. Um, yes, Des, you're on... Um, Dun, 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 Instagram, aren't you? If people want to hit you up, um, yes, yes, I am D E. Uh, so it's des.p22, des.p22. That's the Instagram, and then Twitter is the other way around. It's p22 des, p22 des, and those are the two that you'll 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 get me on. Um, and as I said, yes, I've been getting some some nice response. And um, and so it may go on. And uh, as I said, it's been nice coming here today, Chris. Been good chatting to you, and and thank you very very much for um, allowing me to speak about the book. That's been very good of you. Thank you. No problem, Des. Thank thanks for coming on the show. Um, fascinating story. I look forward to um, getting a copy of your book, and um, should say thank you to our. 
friends at home as well hope you've all enjoyed this as much as i have if you could like and subscribe that would be wonderful and we will see you next time thank you